You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thank you for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. And in today's show, we're going to be getting an overview of First Majestic Silver Corp. Uh, about once a year since I started this show, I reach out to Keith Newmeyer, its founder, president, and CEO to talk about the silver market, as well as to get an update on one of uh, the silver investors market darlings, that is First Majestic Silver. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker AG and also on the big board in Toronto under the ticker FR. Keith, welcome back onto the show. Well, it's great to see you again, Bill, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Let's start off by talking about the silver market in general. As we look back on 2020, what are some of the key metrics, trends, all in sustaining costs that uh, resource investors should be aware of? Well, geez, it was a pretty interesting year, uh, 2020, as everyone knows. Um, um, we had some of the most extreme volatility I think the markets have experienced, at least since um, uh, 2018 and, and even 2015 or 2016. But, um, you know, we started the year off pretty aggressively <clears throat> with a big capital investment program scheduled for Mexico. Uh, we're, you know, we started the year off around 17 or $18 silver, if I remember correctly. And, uh, you know, silver plunged with the rest of the market all the way down to around $12 in March of um, um, 2020. Uh, I knew it wouldn't last. Um, you know, I actually was, uh, went into the market and bought a couple of million ounces of silver because I just thought it was so cheap. And um, we also suspended our sales of silver as well. Uh, so we not only made money on the trade of the futures market, but we also made money by delaying about a million ounces of sales until uh, the third quarter when prices resumed its uptick and uh, broke through $20 an ounce. And silver, lo and behold, hit $29 an ounce, uh, surprising everyone uh, in August of 2020. And it settled down a little bit, of course. You know, we're in the $25 range, but it's sure different than it was back a year ago. So we're pretty happy with the gold price, the silver price. I'm a bull. I think the metals are going a lot higher, but you know, we ended the year off you know, with a challenge in Q2 because of the COVID and the disruptions there. We lost a couple of million ounces of production. Uh, we came in with a projection of somewhere around 24 million ounces of silver equivalent uh, production for 2020. We came in about 22 million, uh, you know, purely related to COVID. But um, we ended the year Q3, Q4 off on a very strong note. And we had actually ended the year with record amount of cash in the bank of all, just under $240 million. So with your, you're in one company, one company, one metal is one of the themes or monikers of the company. Was Mexico affected as much as Peru or was it affected less in terms of the decrease in silver output? Yeah, I think it was, you know, it'd be interesting to see what the actual numbers are at the end of the day, because um, I haven't seen the final uh, export numbers from those countries. But um, um, it appears to me, just from what I understand, that Argentina and Peru were hit harder on a percentage basis of total production, uh, just because they had their mines shut down for a longer period of time. Mexico only really had a shutdown for about six weeks, and uh, Mexico deemed mining essential. Uh, just like Canada did, uh, and uh, uh, Argentina and, and Peru did not do that. So they had extended shutdowns, and some of the other miners, of course, had um, uh, some challenges with reopening their operations. But um, we had pretty well everything back up and running by Q3. Uh, you know, our team acted pretty swiftly. It's it's pretty tough to, you know, um, tell 500 workers or 600 workers just to go home, um, and and it, it's still carrying maintenance. You know, you've got pumps you have to keep running there's you know you got to keep electricity going you've got to there's you can't just walk away from a big industrial complex because stuff will go wrong and you know it'll it, it, there could be serious issues so you have to leave a minimum workforce there for maintenance and uh so the workforce is i, I actually never went down to zero but um the uh, government did do the right thing and they did deem mining as essential which was great for mexico and uh we we're able to get our mines back up and running are you still the largest pure silver producer in the world? <clears throat> no, um, I don't think we've ever been the largest pure silver producer. When you say that- On a percentage pure... basis of production for a major- Right, yes. Yeah, okay. From a revenue base, yes, we still are. Um, uh, just a little, uh, the, the approximately 60% of our revenue comes from the sale of silver, 40% uh, gold. We're in a great position where we only produce two metals, uh, silver and gold. Uh, if you go back to you know 2017, when we had seven mines operating, we produced lead, zinc, and silver and gold. 
And, you know, producing lead and zinc, there's really no money in it. And it's a very, um, it's a lo losing proposition. Um, uh, unless you are a very large uh, producer where, where you can actually get decent deals with um, the smelters. But as a small lead or zinc producer, a small miner will never make money uh, in that marketplace. So uh, we shut those mines down that were producing concentrate and we're just focused on dory bars. So all three mines produce silver and gold dory bars, which is a great thing. Are you looking to divest any of your projects? I know you've done that in past years. Would that be a way to kind of uh, trim and make the company more streamlined? Yeah, for sure. Um, um, you know, it takes two to tango, obviously. And, and um, uh, you know, we've got a pretty interesting, interesting portfolio of assets that are that are on the sales block. But um, at the same time, we don't want to give them away. You know, they, these are, you know, these were at one point in First Majestic's history, you know, pretty big assets. Um, you know, Lapria was a three and a half million ounce producer. Uh, Del Toro was a two and a half million ounce producer. Uh, Legaterra, a two million ounce producer. Um, uh, San Martin, you know, another two million ounce producer. You know, so these are nice assets in a junior in a junior company, and uh, they could actually really you know, make a new company if, if someone would ever decided to uh, purchase them. But for us, you know, we, we have to look at bigger things because, you know, for us to move the needle now at the, our, the size of our business, you know, we, you know, it doesn't do us any good to have a million ounce producer, right? But for a junior, it might be fantastic for them to to have that. And uh, and we offer a portfolio to those uh, who want to look at them. But, um, you know, on the, on the M&A front, you know, we're quite active looking around the world and, you um, you know, for, for uh, nice chunky assets to add to our portfolio. Keith, can you delve a little more into that? What would be the profile of what you'd want to acquire? Would it only be a producer or like a late stage development project? Definitely can't be an exploration company because I think um, it's just too low down the, the spectrum. But um, it could be a development company um, that has proven ounces that that is, uh, uh, you know, most likely fully permitted uh, that doesn't require a lot of extra time for permitting it could have a couple holes in, in it but um, um ad, you know further advanced the better uh, producing asset would be obviously the best uh, but they're hard to find because you know we're you know you, your question earlier about the purity of our revenue it's something that we take very dear to our heart and uh you know i, I don't want to become a gold company or at least um you know not, not on the long term so we're always looking for ways of uh, keeping our silver purity and, and, and uh, um, finding silver mines is a pretty difficult thing. And you, you probably heard me say uh, many, many times that, you know, we're only mining as an industry for every one ounce of gold. We're only mining eight ounces of silver. Um, and that's a pretty shocking statistic. You know, it shows you that gold, or pardon me, it says silver is much more rare than people think it is. And, and uh, finding a good silver mine is very difficult. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsor. Silver One Resources is an exploration and development company backed by strategic investors Eric Sprott and SSR Mining. At Silver One's Candelaria Mine Project in Nevada, there is already a historic resource estimated at 127 million ounces of silver, which Silver One is developing and advancing. The company's Phoenix Silver Project, located within the Arizona Silver Belt, is an early stage exploration project on which native silver vein fragments have been discovered near surface. One grab sample assayed an astounding 14,688 ounces per ton. Yes, that's right. Ounces, not grams. Silver One has tremendous exploration potential, is extremely leveraged to the price of silver, and is cashed up and poised to increase shareholder value. Silver One trades in New York under the ticker SLVRF and in Toronto under the ticker SVE. To learn more, go to silverone.com. That's silverone.com. You know, one of the growth strategies of a lot of gold producers and Equinox stands out at that uh, with Ross Speedy, what he's done in the last two years, these at the market mergers of existing producers. There's so few silver producers. Is that even in the realm of possibility for your growth? Well, as I said earlier, you know, it takes two to tango. Um, you know, we, you know, we know the space quite well. Um, you know, I don't need to sit here and name names, but, um, you know, there's a handful of companies that, um, you know, we know we're close to, we talk to. Um, but, you know, at the same time, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, I think, you know, the mining executives, they're, 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 um, you know, they're, they're very, um, you know, resilient individuals who, who, you know, have been able to weather, you know, multiple cycles over the last 30 years. And, 
you know, most of them are my age. And then, uh, um, and then we've all lived through the last, you know, several cycles. And then, uh, you know, we're, we're all very optimistic that uh, we're in a pretty, you know, powerful cycle that's going to go for another at least three to five years. And uh, I just think that there's a, um, a view out there that, you um, uh, you know, a lot of people want to ride that cycle, and uh, it's really putting a, a, a slowdown on M and A. And also, I think the the whole um, conference circuit as well has really negatively impacted the the M and A activity in the business because you know we would all get together as an industry several times throughout the year at these different mining conferences, and we would meet up and have casual discussions and uh, you know have a beer or two, and uh, you know just you know, and it's surprising how many you know, fruitful discussions take place in those types of casual types of uh, meetings uh, that are, you know, non-scheduled. They just happen. Um, you can't do that in today's environment. You know, you're not going to schedule a Zoom call with CEO of ABC just to enter into an M&A discussion. It's just not going to happen, right? It's just, so it, it does make uh, things a lot more difficult. I understand the point about silver CEOs wanting a payday in this up cycle, but isn't the principle that even a retail investor could see that one plus one equals three when you do a lot of these at the market mergers? So why couldn't a CEO also see that if a, your average retail investor could see that? You know, Bill, you have to really ask the other CEOs. Uh, I, I, look, I, I'm a finance guy. I'm not a geologist. I'm not an engineer. That's the way I think. Right. And that's how I built this business. I put First Majestic together by buying stuff. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've never really developed anything from scratch. You know, I guess, you know, Del Toro was, was somewhat built by scratch, but at least we knew there was an order party there. Um, Urban Tanya was a, a made in discovery. So that's at, at Santa Elena. So that's, that's, I guess, an exception. But in most cases, you know, we bought stuff that is already producing or close to producing and built this business to what it is today. And that's my comfort zone. That's what I like to do. Okay. The short position on your company is quite large. And I was kind of shocked recently where I saw a silver bull recommend to his subscribers shorting your company. What can you share with us about the short position on First Majestic? Yeah, it's hard to really understand why it's so high. Um, uh, it could just be pure liquidity. You know, the stock, um, uh, you know, people should call Todd Anthony, our VP corporate development, and have this discussion with him because he's more on top of this stuff than, than I am. But, um, um, you know, the, the, the stock trades something like its entire issued outstanding shares every quarter. Um, it actually sometimes trades twice its outstanding shares in every quarter. So it's, it's one of the most liquid mining stocks on the planet. And, and, and it's got such a high beta to silver, like it moves like crazy when silver prices move. So it's just this darling of, of these traders that, um, trade this stock because they can get in and out of it very quickly. Um, and and uh, they have a view on silver or they're uh, maybe positive or negative or, or, or they, or they buy another silver stock that they view as cheaper than us on a multiple of some nature. And so they short us and go along the other ones. So they use it as a hedge against their other portfolio positions. You know, we don't know exactly, you know, what's driving the short position, but it is extremely high. Like we, the, the, the company has um, always had a relatively high short position of anywhere between 10 and 15% over the last decade. And it's just been there. It's just this natural, you know, whatever it is. And, and, and then at, at the end of December 31st, 2020, we had an 18% short position, which of course, you know, got our attention and goes, hmm, this is interesting. Uh, new, new shorts coming in and look, silver prices had rallied from, you know, 15 to 25. So maybe just people have a view that maybe silver is going to crack because we're going to go into a recession in 2021 and maybe copper prices, silver prices will get dragged down. So people maybe take a, a, a negative view on that. I think it's nonsense myself, but you know, who knows like what these hedge funds do. And, um, um, uh, then lo and behold, you know, the January 15th um, short report comes out and the short position is 23%. It's never been that high before. Um, and it's, it's, you know, pretty hard to imagine, you know, cause that the risk on that, you know, you, you know, you, you know, you have $30 silver, which I think is going to happen in 2021. And this stock is going to, you know, well, I shouldn't, you know, my, I assume I shouldn't make, you know, two bold statements, but I would assume the stock would do quite well. Um, in an environment like that. So I surely would not be one of short First Majestic uh, in an environment like this, because I think we're going into a very high inflationary environment where copper and silver prices will see dramatic increases over the next couple of years. 
Keith, you issued a dividend policy, which kind of took me by surprise as an observer because your business is so capital intensive. Many people look at silver as a speculation, not an investment. So can you elaborate more on why you did that rather than just holding on to the capital for the purposes of M&A and acquisitions and growth through that means? Well, I guess for one thing, you know, the shorts will have to cut a check, right? So it, it makes makes their short position a little bit more expensive. Um, that's one reason for doing it. But the other reason for doing it is just the cash flows. You know, we we um, almost started paying a dividend in 2012. Um, uh, thank goodness we didn't start because we might have had to have stopped, unfortunately, uh, just because of what happened in the marketplace over the next five, six years. But, um, you know, I think we're going to go into a long-term sustainable market here. And, and, you know, I think we could easily have a, you know, good, strong five-year bull market. Uh, we're we're going to maybe longer if we're lucky. And uh, we're going to be generating a lot of cash. And, and, and I think it's about time we return some cash to shareholders. And, um, you know, there are institutions out there, believe it or not, that, that won't buy a stock that does not pay a dividend. Um, it's it's not a huge group. Uh, um, most people that buy mining stocks don't buy mining stocks for a dividend, but there are some. So it's just you know adding to our basically list of potential investors in the institutional world that you know, has that requirement. And um, it's just one more box to check if you're going to look at First Majestic, why should I buy it? And that's a question that comes up. So we're we're now starting that. Are you thinking about launching another mining company before your career is over? I was thinking about this. Ross Beatty is, seems like he can't retire. You know, you're expecting a silver up cycle, but you have one more company up your sleeve. You know, I'm always investing in, in startups. Uh, you know, my, my risk tolerance for the mining sector is probably higher than most. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I am a seed investor in a, in a variety of different companies and uh, like to help management out. I'm just seeding a company right now called Snowline Gold. It's not public yet, but it'll be public on the CSC in the next 30 days, I hope. And uh, we got Paul Matissic, uh, Quinton Henning involved in that. We've got Nick uh, Matissic's Paul son as the CEO. We've got Scott Burdell as the COO uh, with his father, you know, put together this huge gold portfolio of exploration assets in the Yukon, super high grade, super sexy portfolio. So I'm super excited about that. But I look, Silver One is a company that um, I'm heavily invested in as well. Um, I, I helped uh, seed that company, well, geez, five years ago now. Um, and I still remain a very substantial shareholder of that company. So, you know, I, I go after management teams, um, um, you know, because it's really comes out of management at the end of the day, how these things actually survive because they need to survive during the downturns. And uh, you need management teams that knows how to pull back, know how to stop spending money, know how to keep the lights on. And it's a skill that, um, you know, some people simply, you know, don't get. And, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of these small little startups that, you know, blow their share caps up at the bottom of the market. And next thing you know, they've got, you know, a billion shares outstanding because they didn't raise the money at the right time, you know, in, in, when the bull cycle is there. So it's a, it's a bit of an art, but um, yeah, it's, it's a sector that I love and a sector that I'll continue to uh, support. But me putting my name on another company, it's, uh, I've got First Mining Gold, which I'm the chairman of and the founder, a great gold portfolio in Ontario. People should look at it. And of course, First, my, uh, First Majestic Silver, my full-time job, which takes, uh, you know, which I, I've got a whole passion for, takes up most of my time. All right. Well, Keith, thank you for coming on Mining Stock Education today. I'll put a link to First Majestic in the show notes. And you should already know the tickers if you're invested in this sector. It's FR in Toronto and AG in New York. Keith, thanks again. Thanks, Bill. Great interview. Appreciate it. Thank you.